This episode of Real Science is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Sign up today at curiositystream.com slash real science and get free access to watchnebula.com. In this mess that is our current world, there is so much information coming at us about what is or isn't an effective treatment against the coronavirus. Hydroxychloroquine, for example, first praised based on a small, questionable study, then debunked as being ineffective, and now being praised again based on another criticized study. Medicine shouldn't be politicized, but that is what's happening. And it's so hard to know what's true and what is nonsense. So when headlines broke recently about another potential coronavirus treatment, it's understandable if your immediate reaction was skepticism. Mine certainly was. The treatment, dexamethasone, is a common corticosteroid, and it's being hailed as the biggest breakthrough so far in coronavirus treatment. Scientists are saying the results of a recent clinical trial are astounding and are saying the importance of the findings can't be overstated. It's cheap, it's readily available, and reports are saying that it could drastically decrease coronavirus deaths. So is this actually the start of a new chapter in coronavirus treatment as the headlines say? How could it be that a humble, common steroid can outperform every other treatment that has been tested so far? Treating viral infections is not straightforward. A virus is difficult to kill because it's not alive to begin with. Bacterial infections can be fought with antibiotics, which attack the bacteria's cell walls, block protein production, and stop bacteria from reproducing, breaking down the elements that give them life. But antibiotics aren't effective against viral infections because viruses don't carry out any of those processes on their own. Instead, they hijack a host cell's machinery, forcing it to replicate the viral genome and produce viral proteins. So medications that aim to treat viral infections aim to stop the virus from being able to hijack the host machinery, preventing it from replicating. Remdesivir, the antiviral being used against the coronavirus, works by blocking polymerase from making new strands of RNA. Remdesivir is a molecule very similar to adenine. If it is present, the polymerase enzyme may accidentally place it in the sequence instead of adenine, which terminates the strand. But antivirals are challenging to develop. They need to be tailored to work for each specific virus. It's also difficult to find drugs that interfere with viral replication without also harming the host cell. Also, because they don't deactivate or destroy the virus, all they can do is prevent the viral load from increasing to a point where it causes illness. So antivirals can be used to manage a viral infection, but can't completely get rid of it. It took decades for antivirals to be developed to the point where they could manage diseases like HIV. And even still, they are no cure. In the case of the coronavirus, remdesivir has been shown to shorten the amount of time that patients need to spend in the hospital, but it had no statistically significant impact on deaths. But the virus itself is not the only thing that makes a coronavirus infection deadly, and deactivating it is not the only way to treat the disease. The virus damages the body when it hijacks human cells and subsequently kills or damages them to release more viral particles. This cell damage can certainly harm you and make you sick. But in the case of this coronavirus, the people who are dying from the disease don't usually die from the viral infection itself. If the virus migrates to the airway, as it does in symptomatic cases of COVID-19, it begins to replicate and invade lung cells, and in particular, the lung's ciliated cells. As these cells begin to die, they shed away and fill the airway with debris and fluid. During this time, the immune system kicks in. Immune cells flock to the lungs to help clear debris and repair lung tissue. If everything goes correctly, the immune response is limited to the infected areas and tightly controlled. But sometimes, the immune system gets kicked into overdrive and can do way more harm than good. This overreaction of the immune system is known as a cytokine storm. Cytokines are molecules that allow for the communication between cells and usually signal the immune system to start doing its job. But in a cytokine storm, their levels soar far beyond what's needed. The excess of cytokines attracts an excess of immune cells, such as lymphocytes and neutrophils, resulting in extreme inflammation in the lungs. And this extreme inflammation can cause a lot of damage. It can lead to high fever, leaky blood vessels, blood clotting, and wreaks general havoc on the body. 
white blood cells are misdirected to attack and inflame even healthy tissues, leading to failure of the lungs, heart, liver, and kidneys. In the worst cases, it leads to a condition called ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Blood oxygen levels plummet, and it becomes extremely hard to breathe. Alveoli become completely full of fluid. Many patients with ARDS end up on ventilators, and many die. It has an estimated mortality of approximately 40%. So sadly for most people who die of COVID-19, it's not the virus itself that kills, but a disastrous overreaction of their own immune system. Scientists aren't sure exactly what causes some people to be more susceptible to cytokine storms than others, but believe it may have something to do with a genetic mutation in some people and pre-existing conditions in others. It also could be the reason why younger people are less affected by the coronavirus, as their immune systems are less developed and may produce lower levels of cytokines. So in the absence of a vaccine or a more effective antiviral, scientists and doctors are left trying to treat the symptoms of the infection to try to keep patients alive. And this is where dexamethasone, the common steroid, is making waves in the headlines. It all started in the UK in one of the biggest and most important scientific studies going on in our lifetime, the recovery trial. The recovery trial first made headlines when it found that the much talked about potential treatment hydroxychloroquine had no benefits to patients hospitalized with COVID-19, despite the hype. Now, the recovery trial is making headlines again, with a result that researchers did not really expect, that dexamethasone, a common steroid, was hugely beneficial to the most critically ill COVID-19 patients, more beneficial than any of the other numerous treatments that they have been testing. It cut deaths by about one third in patients who were on ventilators, and by about one-fifth in patients receiving oxygen therapy but were not on ventilators. And while these numbers imply that this drug can't save everyone, it is by far the most promising result that researchers have found. Researchers believe it works because steroids like this are known to decrease inflammation and suppress the immune system. This is also why it only works in the most severe cases of COVID-19, where the immune system has flared up to damaging levels. Since steroids like this have been known to decrease inflammation for a long time, it seems like maybe it should have been obvious that something like this would help. But that is definitely not the case. Steroids like this were tried during the SARS and H1N1 epidemics, but the results were inconclusive, with some data even saying it would be harmful. But the results from the dexamethasone clinical trial are promising. And because of how robust the study was, when this research says dexamethasone will save countless lives, we can trust it. This is largely because of the size of the trial. Researchers enrolled 2,100 participants who received dexamethasone at a low to moderate dose for 10 days and compared how they fared against 4,300 people who received standard care. And the results showed not subtle improvement, but highly statistically significant improvement. For any of you stats people, the p-values and confidence intervals for the results were very good. However, treatment with dexamethasone is not without its challenges. When you suppress an overactive immune system, you may also block a person's ability to recover. This is why it's important that the drug isn't given in the early stages of infection, when the body needs its full arsenal of immune action. While the full data is yet to be released, doctors have found the preliminary results compelling enough to start using it. It is now a standard of care for patients with severe COVID-19 in the UK. Because it's not a new drug, doctors are confident they can give it to patients while managing the risks and side effects. And for $10 for a course of treatment, it's hard to not see how this drug will be hugely influential in the fight against COVID-19. In stark contrast, Gilead Sciences just announced that they will soon be charging over $3,000 for a single course of remdesivir. Discovering that a cheap, readily available, well-known and well-studied drug is effective for the worst cases of COVID-19 is a fantastic glimmer of hope in an otherwise bleak crisis. And while this steroid is exciting news, what I'm most excited about is the existence of the recovery trial itself. It's the largest trial being conducted for COVID-19 anywhere. Its adaptive design that can evaluate half a dozen drugs at once has already proven to be extremely effective in making progress towards the best coronavirus treatments. Their data monitoring committee reviews results as they come in, 
allowing the trial to drop any drugs that clearly don't work or even add new ones. It is more robust and more nimble than one could have ever expected in such a short time. And information like what they are gathering that works towards eliminating the speculation and politics from COVID-19 healthcare will be the way we end this pandemic. I know that at this point, all the coronavirus news and updates can be exhausting. It's important to know what's going on, but equally important to switch off from it all sometimes. I definitely go through cycles of wanting to understand every new piece of information that comes out and not wanting to hear anyone utter the phrase coronavirus for a week. And for this reason, CuriosityStream has been the perfect place to satisfy either of my moods. If you're in a mood of wanting to understand the treatments or vaccines being developed, you should watch Coronavirus Combating the Outbreak on CuriosityStream, where experts share the methods currently in place to slow down this infectious disease. But if you are in a mood where you can't bear one more single second of coronavirus news, then the new series, Nigel Lotto Blow Stuff Up, may be the perfect antidote. In the first episode, he explodes some potatoes and sausages with electricity, leading up to seeing what similar shocks do to a human, and ultimately seeing if Nigel can survive a lightning bolt. It's a really well-made series that is the perfect, still educational distraction from the news. And if you're a fan of educational content and looking for more quality things to watch right now, then this is the perfect time to sign up because a subscription to CuriosityStream now comes with a subscription to Nebula. Nebula is a place where top educational content creators like Polyphonic, Wendover Productions, and our other channel Real Engineering can create videos freely without worrying about the YouTube algorithm or demonetization. It's a place where we can upload our content ad-free and also experiment with original content and new series. The original content is my favorite part of Nebula, shows like Real Engineering's Logistics of D-Day series. The last episode was about the aerial landings that made D-Day possible, and the next one will be about the logistics of air support. So if you sign up for CuriosityStream at curiositystream.com slash real science, you'll get a subscription to CuriosityStream and a subscription to Nebula for now just $14.79 a year, 26% off the usual price. By signing up, you're not just supporting this channel, but all of your favorite educational content creators. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon are below.